Hey, Nikki. Hey, Selena. And hello, everyone. And welcome to Sweet Tea and TV. Hey, y'all. It's, welcome. Uh, yeah. And it's been a while again. Ah, oh, darn it has. Yeah. Um, okay, well, we've got a lot to cover today. We've got a big episode. We've got some surprises coming along. But before we get to that, first, Nikki Mays. Yes. You went on a trip. We want to hear about your trip. You allege. You allege I went on a trip. It was weeks ago. That, well, that, okay, but we can't do anything about that. So uh, I'll just go ahead and spoil it oh, uh, that uh, Nikki went to Disney World. Disney. Uh, yeah. Mickey, Minnie. Nick, yep, okay. Mickey Mouse Clubhouse. <laughs> Something's happening. Mm. Um, My brain turned off. <laughs> no, it happens to the best of us. <laughs> um, so I thought that what we could do is talk. I, I want to hear a little bit about it. And uh, I hope y'all do because you're about to hear about it. Otherwise, um, fast forward. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's always an option. Uh, but so I thought I would just ask, like, you were just in Disney, which is one of my favorite places on earth. It's the most magical place on earth. It is. Uh, what was your number one favorite thing that happened? I know that's tough because that it, really it tough. sounds like it was a good trip. But if you had to just pick one thing, that is really tough. Um, I have a couple of front runners. Uh, I rode Tower of Terror with my son. Uh, Tower of Terror at Hollywood Studios is one of my favorite rides. My daughter flat out said no, she would never do it. My son is young enough that he didn't know to question it, so he rode it with me. Um, <laughs> And great. how did he feel about it? He doesn't want to do it again, uh-huh. but uh, he didn't cry or anything. I was fully prepared for him to cry and me to feel like a terrible parent, but um, he didn't. So that was great. I rode Space Mountain with my daughter. Space Mountain is another one of my favorite rides, and that was magical. She said, I really liked it, Mommy. Probably don't want to do it again, but I really liked it for you. I'm glad I was able to do that for you. <laughs> so funny um but we also ate dinner in cinderella's castle oh you did we did Mm -hmm. which was a uh sort of like a bucket list item for me me too i love that it's a bucket list item for you yes okay yeah it's a bucket list item for all of us but especially me (laughs) i just wanted to know i just wanted to know know. right it's Um, like the room that you can stay in there yeah but you can only be invited you have to be invited you can't even pay your way into it yeah i looked that up (laughs) it's the only thing that's keeping me right (laughs) otherwise i'd be like lay all the money down we went to disney last year uh for my daughter's fifth birthday and we planned everything super last minute and one of the things about disney this is probably the thing that irks me the most is like how in the weeds you have to be on it to get to do the things you want to do Mm. so like it's just if you don't know you don't know you know so like if you don't realize that you have to make reservations 60 days in advance or whatever it is and you have to be online when the reservation system opens at 6 a.m um, you miss it all. And so we booked everything within like a month and a half last time and just missed everything. So this time we were like, nope, we're going to plan it in advance and we're going to do all these things. Um, so we um, got on the website, like I think it's 60 days. I might have that wrong, but like however many days in advance. And my husband and I were on two different computers, two different phones, trying to see like what reservations we could get. We could only get 315 for a dinner seating. Oh. So we ate dinner at 315. Oh. Yes. Were you hungry again later? Uh yes and that was the night we were at magic kingdom so that was the night they had my husband had treated me to like the hocus uh, the um mickey's not so scary halloween party which had like a hocus pocus theme Mm -hmm. um so he had gotten us tickets for that after hours event so we had an opportunity to eat other things later um but yeah we were definitely hungry again but it was really good it was very expensive but the service once you get seated the service was really top tier and it Mm. was really nice okay so. Can, don't you don't have to i mean i would love for you to but i know we need to get into the episode like give me like a, a taster for the menu anything well let's see what i can remember is it like chicken well i was gonna or? show you i got a champagne flight um Ooh. and they have some like because it was the 50th anniversary celebration going on so one of the champagnes that i had had glitter in it Fine. um and they were did it change the taste of the drink the shimmer i don't think so okay i don't think so i had pork belly so i had pork oh, belly yeah. and um like a corn of some kind and then i think there i think that other thing is like sweet potatoes i think um my kids had chicken tenders of course but it came with um land and got mashed potatoes which were heavenly oh yeah they were super whipped and super delicious and then of course you can see he's eating um a corn on the cob mm-hmm. um and then kyle i think got some kind of steak um, but I did go ahead and order, uh, it comes with dessert. 
So I, I went ahead and got a dessert. This was like a chocolate um, mousse. Okay. A mousse covered with like a chocolate uh, coating or something. But this was really the best part. We were celebrating my son's birthday. Oh, my gosh. So I got him a Mickey Mouse chocolate cake. Um, and it's like shaped like a little dome and it has Mickey Mouse ears on it. Um, and the kids also, you get, it's like an inclusive dinner. You get dessert too, which is why we have cake and a separate dessert. Both the kids did a cupcake decorating plate. Oh, So they bring fun. you some mini cupcakes and like toppings and stuff. They really know what they're doing. They yeah. really know how to cater to a kid. Yeah. And uh, an adult who wants to be a kid. Yeah. Uh, and I definitely fall into that category. So I got a Mickey Mouse pretzel too. It's a pretzel y'all shaped. Like a like Mickey Mouse shaped like Mickey Mouse. They really, they have their branding is just like on point. You it can't really argue that. is just it's just so amazing. Like Hollywood Studios has the Star Wars land. This is called a Wookie Cookie. Uh -huh. It's an oatmeal like an almost like an oatmeal cream pie that right. looks like um, Chewbacca. Yeah, it has like decorations to make it look like Chewbacca. Um, so those were those were top moments. Like the food was top for me, um, but also at Hollywood Studios because they have Star Wars lands. One of the other things that we did was book reservations for the kids to make droids. Mm -hmm. So they're like these remote control robots. Um, but before that, Kyle made himself a lightsaber. And he could only take one child with him. You can only take one person with you to your appointment. So he took Landon because it was Landon's birthday trip. Um, when they came out, Landon was sobbing. And I thought Landon was upset because he didn't get a lightsaber. And I was like, bud, like you can't get everything. <laughs> And he was like, I don't know. It's not that. And I was like, what is going on? And it took us a couple minutes as he's like sobbing to try to like pull out his words. It's a very immersive experience building the lightsaber. And there's a bunch of script about how you're going to go into the universe and fight bad guys and this, that, and the other. Landon thought Kyle had built a lightsaber and was now going to leave us. Oh, no. And go, in, <laughs> go out into the universe and fight the bad guys. <laughs> oh, bless his heart. It was really sad. Yeah. That um, was really sad. They're really doing a good job then. It's so true to character. So fortunately, our appointment to make the droids was right after that. So it was a very quick, like, no, Landon, this is all pretend. Oh, this is all pretend. Okay. Um, so yeah, we... Uh, left and did the droids and making the droids was really, really fun. The kids absolutely loved it. So there were so many high points. I mean, the trip was amazing. We, we were only gone three days. So, and we went to three parks. So it was just like we're one aware. thing after the other. Mm -hmm. um, so we came home super duper tired and I wish we had built in a buffer day because it felt like we didn't have time to breathe, but also it was just so much packed into you gotta that have short the buffer day. Like for every, at the end of every trip. It really, it would have been helpful. Our flight back was really early. So we did have all day Sunday before we oh, went back to work uh -huh. on Monday. Um, but, you know, kids' schedules at school make it hard. We wanted to go on a weekend where there wouldn't be a ton of people. Um, but anyway, we also did Epcot. We did Hollywood Studios, Magic Kingdom, and Epcot. I've never been to Epcot. So this was my first time. I loved it. I thought it was super fun. I think it's something I probably couldn't go back and redo with the kids. It's just not a super, in my opinion, not a super kid-friendly um, park. They have the Frozen ride now, and they have Ratatouille. Ratatouille is apparently like the hardest ride at all of Disney to get on. I think it's about the adults, though. I think it is. Yeah. I mean, uh, like before we had done any international travel, going through Epcot was like, speaking of tasters, it was like, uh, I mean, it's a little uh, done up more so than probably most of the real places are because it's like, but you're walking through little slices of the world. Right. You know. Yeah. We um, we were there in the middle of the food and wine festival too. Fun. Um, but I really didn't meet very much. I just like, you're just going so fast that I didn't really eat that much. I had a crepe from um, France where Ratatouille was. I had a margarita from, I think, I think it was Mexico. Um, and we tried some like sliders and they were, they were fine, but they weren't like, I wouldn't write home about them. So we really didn't eat that much. I feel like we were trying to get to the rides cause they have a brand new guardians of the galaxy ride, which was like a whole event to try to get on it. So mm -hmm. anyway, it was really fun. I would like to go back just me and Kyle. Like I would love to do park hoppers and then have him and I just go in the evening, but well, you heard it right here. Her number one favorite experience <laughs> was, was all the experiences. So it if really that was. doesn't show how great Disney World is, I don't know what will. Yeah. So it was an amazing trip. Should we talk about Designing Women? We, we probably should. <laughs> season three, episode 19, perhaps. Man, we are barreling towards the end of this season. So close. Uh, this episode is called The Women of Atlanta. 
Hulu IMDb mashup description. You want to say anything about that? I don't remember. I wrote this a long time ago. (laughs) So Selena mashed together two, apparently. It says, the women agree to pose for a famous photographer's upcoming magazine spread called The Women of Atlanta. But soon they're suspicious when he requests poses that are purely sexual. Air date May 1st, 1989. We're calling this one The Real Women of Atlanta. It's written by LBT and directed by Harry Thomason. General reactions, what you got? Yeah, I'll get into the specifics when we get into the category, but I really liked this one a lot. Oh. Um, I thought it was a lot of fun, and it really made me think, which I always like. It's a bonus, I think, Mm. for a show to like kind of make you go through the layers. I think you'll see that as I start to give some of my other feedback. Um, What about you? I think, and maybe along similar lines, I, I will never cease to be amazed at the stories that LBT can weave together happening just in Sugar Bakers. It's crazy to me that this entire episode was built around this one specific location, but it's this story that was so not related to interior design, for instance. Like mm-hmm. it had nothing to do with consulting with clients in a, an interior design business. But she had a storyline in mind that she wanted to tell about um, professional women and how they continue to be treated. Yeah. You know, sub to men. And she did it all within the bounds of the house without making, or the office, without making it feel like, a, this didn't feel like a stretch to me. Yeah. Like some episodes do. This one felt really like Grounded. appropriate. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I yeah. agree. Uh, so my other one is, cause like, I do really think this one was f- fun and I really liked it. But when I said that it really made me think part of what I did is I, I kind of went out and, um, I wanted to look into a few things. I, it's going to start to crystallize, I promise. But the, the themes in this one were still highly resonant, I think, at least for me as a woman. So what I mean by that is women as sex objects, women trivialized women forced to deal with this in the first place, you know, that it's a conscious or maybe unconscious part of our day in the first place, Mm. um, was like really something that hit me. And that got me thinking about where we are today. Uh, is it better? That was sort of the rhetorical question going through my head. And Mm. so I think in some ways it is, I think the culture has shifted. I think women are pushing back more than ever and they're pushing back with their dollars, It's interesting that also in this year, I've also watched two other things that sort of speak to pushing back with the dollars. Uh, It has shifted the very body of the iconic Barbie doll, and it's diversified the portfolio of angels at Victoria's Secret. So Mm -hmm. I think we are seeing some of those things play out in real time, or at least in like the past three-ish years. But on the flip side of that, progress is slow. (laughs) You know that? <laughs> That's what they say. <laughs> and then there's nothing like this show to remind you how slow <laughs> progress is sometimes. Um, and it unravels pretty easily. So I think I see just as much uh, fantas- fantasization. <laughs> Sounds like I had three drinks and tried to say that word. <laughs> um, but like the fantasizing uh, component of women and almost this like making women into a commodity on social media as people would have seen in a magazine spread 30 years ago. So that was kind of something that I was thinking about at the same time. You know, I, um, does that resonate with you at all? Yeah. That's a, (laughs) that's a lot to chew on. Yeah. Yeah. I know. I think I agree with you definitely about women pushing back. And I would say, uh, in addition to doing it with their dollars, I think there are a lot of, uh, influential celebrities who are pushing back against the sexualization of women and like the unnecessary sexualization in some instances. And so the, it's just sort of um, influential women finding their voice. And then it's just that consistent reminder of how people with a platform can change society. And so like if you if you hear that a Reese Witherspoon, for instance, and I'm just using her as an example, I don't have a really good example recently, but if you hear that she was asked to do a magazine um, cover that made her feel uncomfortable and she's like, why do you have me in next to nothing? And she pushes back and she's influential, so she gets to do that. Then it motivates you to do that if you feel like you're put in that position and it kind of gives you a voice. So I think I, I feel like the celebrity females, we have a lot more great role models who feel like they have 
agency. Yeah. We had great role models before, but maybe they didn't have the same amount of agency. And it's weird how social media can be this great thing and also this horrible thing. Because I think on the one hand, like you, uh, there is always be there is always some sort of unattainable look being um, forced upon us. Mm -hmm. I don't care what it is. It's always ridiculous. And it's never something that we can achieve, you know? And I could go back to Botticelli, okay, and on forward, you know? It's just, it's it's market-driven, it's culture-driven, it's patriarchal, it's all of the things. But on the flip side of that, on social media and what you're talking to, if it's a Reese Witherspoon or like Kendall Jenner, whoever it is, they can also automatically get on social media when they feel mm -hmm. like they've been put in an uncomfortable spot. They're no longer being seen like a Delta Burke was or something through this lens of the media. Right. Um, they are, but <laughs> we'll do that too. Um, right. But they also can get out there and put their own voice out there in a much um, faster way. And I think in a way that is um, a little bit more organic mm -hmm. um, and reaches people so quickly, which is important. Mm -hmm. Um, I've got one more serious thing that I want to share and then I swear I'm going to get off my, um, high horse here, okay. <laughs> but I just want to be clear again, like, yes, this was a super fun episode, at least for me. I am really interested to hear what your thoughts are. Cause I think a lot of times we sort of feel the opposite are like most fun episodes. Oh. Sometimes we're on the exact same page. Yin and yang and whatnot. Yes. Um, I, but I think we would be remiss to skip over the fact that big organizations like UNICEF are linking the objectification and sexualization of girls in the media to violence against women and girls worldwide. This is not an insignificant issue. I mean, I think that's actually one of the really cool things about this episode is they don't whop you over the head like I'm about to. She does it in this really subtle fashion that makes you laugh mm -hmm. um, and it's enjoyable and it's not like um, sitting in the middle of a PSA or something. Mm -hmm. So, but I think it's really important to talk about like what these things do to women because it impacts their self-worth, their self-esteem. It's linked to eating disorders. Um, listen to these stats from the Dove Self-Esteem Project. Only 11% of girls worldwide would call themselves beautiful. Six in 10 girls avoid participating in life activities because of concerns about the way they look. One third of all six year olds in Japan experience low body confidence. Australian girls list body image as one of their top three worries in life. While 81% of 10 year old girls in the U.S. say they are afraid of being fat. So I just, you know, I just, I felt like that is, um, we're, this episode is covering a lot of things. I, you said from the top, like we're talking about women in business here, but we're also talking about a man who was coming into sugar bakers and trying to hypersexualize these women to like sell magazines. And so it does feel like it's sort of all in the mix. Um, and so I think this was a big and important swing for LBT. Like I said, it's subtle, but that's what I think made it so darn good. I think the stats around how, young women and girls see themselves are those resonate with me so firmly because I'm raising a girl and yeah. I have read that is a natural um it's just a natural layer of development around seven or eight to that that's about the age that you start comparing yourself to other people yeah I don't think it's um like media driven I think that's just a natural I think that's just your brain like that new wrinkle in your brain that says like oh other people are around me and we all look different and am I different and so that that part is natural the part that is unnatural and I think is directly related to the media's um influence is that you mentioned 10 year olds, but I think I've read as early as eight year olds. Um, some alarming number of eight year olds are thinking about what they're eating as a way of losing weight. That is m horrifying to me. That yeah. is just because my daughter is just two, not even quite two years from that. And that feels so young to me to worry about that. Um, so that resonates with me a lot. Well, I'll put myself out there. I remember starting to weigh myself when I was about eight years old. What in the hell was I worried about? Yeah. You know? Yeah. And I mean, and I think, and it is interesting. I do, I do agree with what you're saying. I, I think it's coming from multiple angles. I mm -hmm. think some of it is like the way that just the human brain works. And unfortunately, sometimes the human brain works against us. I right. mean, that's just the facts. But on the other hand, it is all of these other cultural things, the environment which you're grown up in, like, 
the way that your parents talk to you, the way that people in your orbit talk to you, the things that they're not saying to you, but you pick up on, especially at that age when you're like a sponge. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, and there is a lot of pressure. We've talked about this. There's a lot of pressure of, on women about the way that we look. Um, you know, I think, what was a Some book I read one time that said that, like, we women could run the world if we hadn't spent 37% of our life shaving. Mm-hmm. And I was like, my God, it's true. Mm-hmm. So, anyways, I don't know, just something to chew on. It's a big chew. It's a lot. Big league. You know, it is sort of interesting that in this episode, the one woman who is like sort of outspoken about her, like she really cares how she looks, Suzanne. Even she hit a point in this episode where she was like, all right, this is weird. I'm done with that. So it says like how extreme it was in this episode. I think that's Um, right. Your general reactions were just... Intense. I'm sorry. They were intense. I don't know what more to add to that, except I also will never cease to be amazed by... The trouble Charlene gets the women into. Oh yeah, just her it, it did start with her, world. right? It all started with Charlene. Everything's just good, it's, and it's this amazing opportunity. But it does go somewhere good, and we'll get it there. Does. It does. That's true. Does. Yeah. So strays. Uh, it's pretty clear to me that LBT had, at least at the time, a very specific LA stereotype in mind with Dewitt. Mm-hmm. This like really skeezy guy from the way he dresses to his interactions with everyone. He can't really remember any of the women or their names or like, it's just very obvious that he's so surface level. Um, you know, it just puts off this air of like being too important. That weird bro up moment that he tried to have with Anthony. Oh. <laughs> Where Anthony was like, okay, dude. And then um, calling everybody babe. Ooh, that was really an experience uh, that you don't get anymore today. <laughs> um, and then like all the fake compliments where you're yeah. like, okay, pump the brakes. Too much. Yeah. Um, I have two stray reactions. One, Charlene just carries a picture of Julia and Suzanne around in her purse. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Maybe that was a thing before cell phones. Carrying her own pictures, yeah, definitely. It's just so strange. It's in my eighties things. Ah, but it is it is very funny that like it's like two work colleagues. Like I know they're friends too, yeah. but like still, yeah. I have a picture of you in my wallet. Yeah, uh, guest you. stars. I wanted to mention who Dewitt and Estelle are because okay. they're both people that um, they're both people should be familiar to us. Okay, you don't let me finish my sentence, Selena. <laughs> okay, they are both people. So she's right. Uh, Dewitt was played by Ian Patrick Williams. I don't recognize him from anywhere, but he has a really long filmography. Okay. He shows shows up in places like um, Perfect Strangers, which was a a late Uh 80s sitcom, Major Dad, The Fresh Prince, Gilmore Girls. I don't recognize the character that he plays, but he's just in it. Yeah. Um, Also, fun fact, this wasn't his first Designing Women appearance. He was in Grand Slam Thank You, Ma'am, as like a baseball player. Yeah. He's a background Funny. character. So it also doesn't... won't be his last. Oh. He'll show up again. Do you want to tell us or you want to wait? Uh, no, I don't want to tell you. Okay. Because I don't have it written down. Oh, <laughs> I didn't want to preempt anything. Um, I, th- I think it's season four. Doesn't that show what, like um, how he's able to blend, I guess? Because how many times have you and I watched Gilmore Girls a piece? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, also, it's a crossover with the show, Universes, because... Major Dad features Delta Burke's husband. Yes, Gerald McGraney. Um, slash Dash Goff. So uh-huh. there's some. I think there's something. <laughs> I think there's a lot of crossover uh, during this time because Estelle was played by Wendy Jo Sperber. Yeah, she looked very familiar to me. She appeared in I Want to Hold Your Hand and Grease in the 70s, as well as a movie called Corvette Summer with, of all people, Annie Potts. Yeah, that was one of Annie Potts' first movies, I think. But I recognized her immediately as Marty McFly's sister in Back to the Future uh, from the 80s. Okay. She was also in a ton of TV shows through the 90s and early 2000s, but unfortunately she died of breast cancer in 2005. Oh, wow. Okay. No, I didn't. Well, obviously I didn't know that, but because um, I didn't know all those other filmography things. But yeah, She sad. showed up in a lot of places. I feel like, I wish I had written it all down. I think she was in that show, um, the show about dinosaurs. Where they're actually dinosaurs? Yes. What? Is it called dinosaurs? Yes, the I baby. Think, yeah. Uh, yeah. I think okay. she played a voice in that show. Okay. If my memory is serving me correctly. I don't have that one written down, but I think she I might trust be. trust you. Anyway, those are my, my strays. 
Okay. I only have one other really, well, actually I had two. I was not going to say this one because I forgot to take a picture of it, but I'm just curious if you noticed the incredibly large sleeves on one of Anthony's sweaters. I mean, it was like the bottom of bell bottoms, but it was like a, but like, it was like a knit sweater. On a sweater? Yeah. So I think it may have even been cuffed really closely on his wrist, but they were just the widest bottom Patch. No, I wish you had taken a picture. No, I kept meaning to go back and do it, but you know, time is time. a thief. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was one thing that really caught my attention. And then Julia notes, like her sister, that she does not perspire, oh. and that just really it's caught so my weird. attention. Not yeah, true. I'm like, it's okay to sweat. Like, I know I you have a friend that the... doesn't sweat, but I don't believe it. It really doesn't, and it's not like she really cares about sweating. She just doesn't. She just doesn't sweat. Yeah. All right. So I don't know. Uh, you want to talk about some things that we liked about the episode? Yes. I (laughs) self-admittedly tend to be a little hard on Julia, Uh but I really, really love when we see like this tiny glimmer of human in her. She's always sort of up on a pedestal and every now and then she becomes a human. Uh, So she was dead set on this whole thing. She was up on her high horse about like, this is, no, this is stupid. I'm not doing this. And then DeWitt compared her to legendary Hollywood women. Right. And suddenly she was like, all right, let's, let's go ahead and do it. Right. That's funny. Yeah. Let's just do this. And yeah. I just, I don't, I love that. I love that glimmer of human in her. Yeah. Cause I, you don't really, there is sort of this odd thing. Cause I was like rewatching some of these episodes to prepare and like, not that she is not a gorgeous woman because she is, but they definitely have her set apart as this character Well, she'll walk in any room and suddenly every man is like, you are yeah. beautiful, you know? Yeah. And so it feels like she wouldn't be someone who would fall for those compliments. Mm-hmm. And yet she did. She so. did. Yeah. <laughs> so I really liked that a lot. Uh, um, agreed. I like that we solely focused on the photo shoot instead of distracting with a heavy B plot. That's a good point. Yeah. yeah well, that was the main uh, focus. I think that kind of feeds into what you were saying. Like you 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 continue to be amazed by how much she can make happen just in this one space. Yeah. Um, so it's like she's really good at creating a world and like these realistic, like tight spaces. We don't as you know, we don't get to go a lot of places in sugar bakers, but um, or in designing women, so, and we're we're definitely the first people to call out when there is like a tiny bit of a plot stretch where we're just like, oh my god, we're really yeah. just supposed to believe this. But this one truly was believable, and it kind of reminds me of another thing that I really loved about this episode was it's not a B plot necessarily; it's sort of like a like a uh, a subhead to the main plot. But it's this this concept of trying to get the photos back, and that um, the guest character Estelle or the guest actor Estelle helps them sort of get them back, and that whole little bit of the plot, women helping women, and that whole scene uh, was really well done, and it felt separate from that whole bit with the photographer being there. Although again, it was still all in the same place. Mm-hmm. So I liked that too. Yeah, and I like that we involved all of the characters yes um Mm -hmm. i i I mean i don't mind plots that are focused on one or two people but it just i think when you can just well use all of the cast because Mm -hmm. they are so charismatic and just so good at playing these characters like Mm -hmm. it's just better it makes for a better episode agreed the secret life of anthony and suzanne Oh, um, I forgot it about that. was a high point for me. So in this off-camera misadventure, Anthony apparently had to go over to Suzanne's and help wax her legs. <laughs> <laughs> it's forever her best girlfriend. I'm telling you, it would have made a really good uh, webisode in the mid-2000s. It's true. I, I would have liked a little more time with Charlene's scene uh, where I guess it was like her turn for the photo shoot or whatever. But on the whole, I like that the photo shoot for each of the characters really played to their strengths. Uh, so it seemed to just sort of pick up on these things that are essential to who each one of them are. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then my last one is that I'll get more into it when we go into the Southern reference section but the tribute to real women in Atlanta in 1989 was, I think, the best part of the episode for me. Mm. It made me cry. I, I thought that was really singular because it's one thing to make Atlanta your backdrop, but it was a really classy sh- um, touch to showcase that there are like actually real people here 
Um, and, and they're not all actors and they're not necessarily like models and they come from all different types of backgrounds and they do all kinds of different things. And, and I just, I think that was really something. It also showed the skyline, the Atlanta skyline at the end and, oh boy, things have really changed. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then I cried again. (laughs) Oh, just the passage of time. It's rough, man. So. I did reverse Google image search all of those pictures of the real women at the end, and I didn't get any results. So I'm not confident they're real, real women. But I don't know, because these are pictures from the 80s. So it's not like it was a real story. So I've thought a lot about, this is an offline conversation that we have, but I've thought a lot about that. Because at first I was really bummed, and then I was like, do you know how many things I can't find from this era? Because there just isn't the ability ability to track them back um speaking of things that we didn't like (laughs) not being able to find things what what stood out for you i don't have anything i don't have anything i didn't like in this episode i didn't have anything but i realized that one of my general reactions was a dislike (laughs) and that's that it's interesting to me that in the same episode that is finger wagging at what we do to women that we were also maybe food shaming suzanne um, there's a runner where Anthony accuses her of stealing his cheesecake. And then later, like there's this whole little thing about how she doesn't enjoy cheesecake people, but she enjoys eating cheesecake. Uh. And I don't know. I think just because I'm sure we'll continue to talk about this and we, we check in on this from time to time, but, um, it's difficult to find these parts funny knowing what's happening to Delta Burke in real life. Um, and that what the tabloids and stuff are pulling her through and just like, I'm just going to say that if I was writing for that character and seeing them going through things in the media, I don't think I would drop in a line like that. Mm. So it's just interesting to me is all. It's hard because I, I don't want to keep going back to the play, but also a runner in the play is that Suzanne's always eating junk food. Like anytime mm-hmm. moments get stressful or she's trying to avoid confrontation or just like she walks into a room and eats. Yeah. And it's like, I think it was meant to be built into her character. And, and unfortunately, stuff it, happened in real it life. took like its own, a life of its own. So I hear what you're saying. I think there could have been a more conscious choice, at least the shamey stuff. Like it would have been fine for her to continue to enjoy food, but maybe the shamey stuff. But that's hard for me to disentangle. Yeah. I think that's that's the, exactly the point. Otherwise, I didn't have any dislikes either. That was just one of those things where I was like, eh. So, mm. you ready to rate this sucker? Yes. My rating scale is sequined workwear. Uh-huh. I like it. I gave it a four out of a five. Um, it was a serious topic, but it felt easy to watch. It felt um, enjoyable. I laughed a few times. I think I took a point off because it's it's probably not one that, like, if it just came on that I'd be like, ooh, good, this episode's on. It's not, like, that great. Um, but I liked it. Good, good, good. What about you? Um, mine was five out of five nymphettes named Chardonnay, mm. which uh, was part of Mary Jo's um, runner at the beginning where she was talking about the ridiculousness of the different magazine spreads where – women who are supposedly in the workplace are like also like they don't like have a top on, but Mm. they're like cooking, you know, like that kind of thing. Right. Um, So I just loved it. Uh, How women have been treated in these different areas, um, whether it be the workplace or by the media is important. And so um, I think, I think the topic is just uh, one that really especially needed to get out there at the time. Um, I I think the argument is still there for it to be important today. But it's also, again, another great example of what comedy can do. It can take something and um, that could be reported in another way, and it just shows us in a few sequences without, like, without it having to be, I don't know, so, like, just a bummer to get through, you know? Right. It just keeps it light, and that's success in my book. Who won the episode and who buttered our biscuits? Estelle for the win. She saved the day. I think that's right. Same. She was great. Yep. Uh, she helped sugar bakers get rid of the photos, uh, or she's going to. I guess we can say by the end she has, because yeah. that's why we see the photos. And throughout just the whole episode, you she just was very clear she was there for a paycheck. Like She yeah. was not co-signing onto this whole thing. She thought this was all beneath her, but man, she needed that rent money. Yeah. 
Well, and over the course of the episode, we uh, see her finally realize that it's time to move on from DeWitt and yeah. not just, like, stick around. I will tell you that, like, um, the development of this one was a little different. Because at first, you just kind of think that she's, like, just an annoyed person. Right. I didn't understand what they were really trying to do with her character until she finally opened up. And maybe that was all in the sauce. Yeah. Like, that's what LBT wanted to do. I think that was the idea. It's also interesting because they had that whole, like, she had that line that was interesting where she says... Um, I didn't even know I liked Southern yeah. women, you know, and I was like, is that the way LBT feels about other people's perception of Southern women? Or, uh, um, I was just curious about that. Yeah. Uh, who lost the episode? Who served this lumpy gravy? I mean, DeWitt, obviously, but also kind of Charlene for getting them into the mess. <laughs> it all starts with Charlene. <sighs> Charlene. Yeah. He's just the worst. Just a big old phony. Gosh, there's just nothing like... It, it, it just has to be in my pantheon of least desirable traits in a human being is like being that phony. Mm, yeah. Like it's so ridiculous. Uh, and I just think also it's an argument that he lost the episode because it turns out to be a bad time for him. You know? What do you mean? Like he has a bad episode by the end. Oh, uh-huh. you know, he yeah. lost an entire day's work. He's got nothing to show for it. So I think there is a little justice in the world. He deserved it. Yeah. Designing women. Yeah. Very 80s things? Uh, the first thing I have is the I Love Lucy Club, where they send cassette tapes of the show. But sort of a corollary to that, I have it later. It's the I Love Lucy theme song, which obviously is not an 80s thing, but just like a thing of another time. Yeah. Um, it's playing during the credits. But Lucille Ball died on April 26, 1989, and this show aired like May 1st or whatever. Um, so I think that, that, um, that little bit of the plot where they talk about the cassette tapes was a nod to her. Um, I think it also means it, the reason that got me thinking about this is because they also have a picture of her at the very end. Uh-huh. And I thought, I mean, I guess they mentioned her in the episode, but like they don't do pictures of every celebrity they mention. So I started thinking about it. I was like, when did Lucille Ball die? Found out it was just before this episode aired. So that also means that the show had to have been written and shot super close to air date, which is just like unfathomable to me because of the way we have to stagger our recording it's just yeah. so weird to me that they do it so closely yeah um but i was like super confused when they like had different theme song and then at the end they were playing the i love lucy theme song and then they had a picture of her and i was like what is happening here that's what was happening oh smart okay so yeah thanks. that's a really good catch also it's probably worth mentioning that lucille ball um was a tremendous business person. Mm. So in an episode where we're talking about women in business. Yeah. Uh, we also had a Queen Elizabeth reference. May she rest in peace. Uh, we had a string of female Hollywood legends when DeWitt was talking to Julia, Catherine Hepburn, Anne Bancroft, Lena Horne. Um, I, I don't, sometimes I don't know where else to put these things. So I put them in 80s things. Good. We put them in two different categories. Don't worry, guys. We'll cover them twice. <laughs> Uh, and then there was a string of famous business people from the 70s and 80s, uh, some of whom we've heard before, Donald Trump, Lee Iacocca, and Margaret Thatcher. Business people, influential people. Yeah, I'm going to go ahead and skip down to where I have this, because I think that actually, like, we, what it really is, is we get a string of all of these references, I think, except for maybe a handful. First of all, we get like 35 people references. It's just a huge amount of people like specific people to be mentioned over the course of one episode. Mm -hmm. Again, one of those things that puts me in the mind of Gilmore Girls because like Amy Sherman Palladino also loved to drop in like references to old Hollywood and like a ton all over the course of one episode as well. But I think it is, I think talking about Donald Trump and Lee Iacocca is really um, a specific it really harkens back to the episode because Julia's whole point and her well-deserved rant is that no one would ever dare ask these two business titans of the 80s to lower themselves to posing sexily for some article. Mm -hmm. They're all too serious for that. Mm -hmm. um, and so out of all the references, I felt like those were d two that really rose to the top for me because I think that is such an interesting point um, that they're making. We don't... Uh, on the whole, like, yes, they may use men sexually for some things, but it's like models. They don't use, like, businessmen. I don't even like that term. But they don't use businessmen in that regard. So I just thought that was interesting. But um, going back to 80s things, I think just the, in general, a magazine spread. 
Yeah. Like, it just feels like a, I know magazines still exist, but this just feels like very of the times. And like, it would have been such a big deal. Whereas today, like people don't really buy magazines as much. Uh, you have mentioned Charlene getting out her um, pictures that she had of Suzanne and Julia. It's, it's just really that whole concept of keeping physical pictures on your person, I think is so yeah. entrenched in that time period. Um, Suzanne coming through the door in that gown that she wore, the black gown, uh, reminded me of a Bob Mackie Barbie, which also put me in the mind of the 80s. And, uh, like, the little holiday Barbie dolls. Mm. And then calling lingerie a teddy, mm. to me, just sort of stuck out as more of an 80s reference. Southern things? Mary Max Tea Room is a restaurant here in Atlanta. Um, that was one of the, uh, one of Julia's references at the end about the real women of Atlanta, that they are, I don't know, playing bridge at Mary Max Tea Room or something. Uh, I don't have a lot to describe here about it, except it's just like Southern food. It's very home style. It's, it's a restaurant. I should say that. Uh, and it wasn't always Mary Max Tea Room. And I wish I had written down the name of what it was before. Um, but in the like, it was actually established in the like 40s and 50s under a different name. 45. Ah, there you go. Uh, not only is it a real place, it was started in 1945 by Mary McKenzie. And it was purposefully called a tea room because it was quite difficult for a woman to open a restaurant at the time. There were actually 16 other tea rooms open during this era, and it's the last one that remains. So maybe some part of the name was different, but it's always been known as a tea room, which I mm -hmm. thought was really interesting. And I didn't realize that there was, like, sexism built into it, which I thought was really interesting. Makes sense. Um, and it, doesn't it, though? <laughs> We also get a shot of the lady in front of the Capitol building that they talk about. I think her name was Ruby. This is also someone we couldn't verify, but that is referring to the Atlanta Capitol building where the branches of state government are located. Uh, I, I just, I think what's more interesting is just, this is probably one of the older buildings in, in all of um, Atlanta. It was uh, completed on July 4th, 1889 for just under a million dollars. And it is largely made of Georgia materials. We've also talked extensively about the Piedmont driving club, which gets another mention because of the debutantes. I, I didn't want to go back through Piedmont driving club. You've done such a nice job, like covering the ins and outs of that. But, you know, unsurprisingly, I was able to confirm in multiple places that this was the creme de la creme spot for debutantes. This and like maybe two other places, especially in the 60s. So I'm not surprised that it made LBT's list there at the end. Uh, the larger article that the ladies are posing for is a salute to the New South. And I just wanted to say like this post-Civil War era and the New South in general is mentioned with some frequency over the course of the show. Like... And in fact, in the play, since that's also fresh on our minds, like Julia again mentions the New South. Mm -hmm. How about references we need to talk about? I talked about the I Love Lucy connection. That was my big, that was my big one. That was a good get. That was impressive. Um, Mary Jo says at some point, except like someone is wearing nothing except knee socks and a little red tam. Mm. And I was like, what's a tam? Uh, so this is some kind of little hat. So if someone's wearing nothing but knee socks and a little hat, <laughs> I think that definitely draws the picture that Mary Jo was looking to say about whatever article she was reading with um, a woman being covered. Yeah, I think it's like a schoolgirl. I'm pulling up the tam. It's it's like a it looks like a little bit beret ish. I think that's right. And yeah. it's kind of like a schoolgirl vibe. I think. Yeah. Well. Ever enduring and popular, is it not? It's true. Uh, we also get this, uh, Suzanne says the photographer better not turn out to be any kind of a cheesecake. I didn't know what that meant. Mm. So, did you know what that meant? Mm. Okay. So, I mean, I just assumed like cheese ball. Me too. That's not it. Oh. So, when I looked it up, this is a term that's fallen out of use, but mm. it refers to images of appealing, scantily clad uh, women. Whereas we're, we may have heard of things like a beefcake oh. is referring to men. Mm -hmm. So cheesecake is that kind of idea, but for a woman. Wait, I'm confused. So does that mean Suzanne was on to him as being like a skeezy? I guess so. Yeah. Okay. I guess so. Hmm. 
So, um, and I think if we had known that, that would have been interesting to have had that frame of reference in mind. But I totally thought cheese ball, especially mm-hmm. when we meet him right. and he is quite cheesy. So, yeah. uh, really interesting there. I actually think I only have one other one, which was Margaret Thatcher, which I, in a, in an episode where we're talking kind of about the strength of women, um, you know, just important to say that she was the first female prime minister of the UK and the longest serving of the, uh, and the longest serving prime minister of the 20th century. She evokes a lot of strong opinions, mm-hmm. but there is no doubt that she is a member of the breaking through that glass ceiling club. Mm-hmm. What about cut lines? I have three. So right after Charlene said DeWitt was looking for representative, attractive women, uh, this line was cut right before Julia said she didn't want to rain on Charlene's parade. I mean, Tommy let it slip that DeWitt's also photographing some of the other decorators over at the design center. I mean, so, you know, even if he did photograph us, it doesn't mean we'd even be in the magazine. I'm sharing that because I'm reading that as someone reading hesitation from Charlene and Mary Jo about this photo shoot. Um, and so they use this concept of competition to motivate them a little bit to participate. Mm, um, so mm-hmm. I just feel like it, it sets an early stage for this guy, this concept, this whole storyline. Um, Mary Jo also had one more example of the types of women they tend to include in these sorts of features. So you mentioned the knee socks and the tam. Um, but she also gave another example. It's not much to write home about, but just there was more there. And then um, there was a really big cut. Um, You had mentioned how each of the women's subsections of the photo shoot really represented them. Uh, Charlene's actually, I think, was cut. Um, He asked her to lower her zipper, lick her lips. Uh, But most importantly, that's when Estelle notices her I Love Lucy tapes and comments on how happy they make her. And that's sort of the beginning of this connection between the ladies and Estelle. Yeah, those are significant. They're pretty big cuts. Yeah. So next episode, episode 20, Stand and Fight. We'd love everyone to follow along with us and engage. Instagram and Facebook at Sweet Tea and TV. Email SweetTeaTVPod at gmail.com. Our website is www.SweetTeaTV. There are also several ways to support the show. You can tell your friends and family about us. Rate and or review the podcast wherever you listen. And we have some additional ways um, on our website from the Support Us page where you can support the show. And hang tight for extra sugar. What do we have this week? Well, this week, based on the episode, we're going to talk about women-owned business. And then we're going to hear some sage advice from a special guest. So, you know what that means. What does it mean, Selena? It means we'll see you around the bend. Bye. Welcome to this week's edition of Extra Sugar. In honor of this week's Designing Women episode, I thought we could chat a little bit about women-owned businesses. Feels like a good time to mm-hmm. do that. So we'll start by checking in on the numbers, and then we're going to hear from a special guest. Oh, I love special guests. It's going to be my mom! Yay! <laughs> This is her favorite episode of all time? It's her favorite Designing Women episode. So, you know, Nikki and I had a conversation a long time ago, like even towards the start of the show, like yeah. where, places where we might be able to incorporate our moms. But when I told my mom that we were even having that conversation, she just went on and on about this episode and mm. how like, you know, hey, if there's something there, that's the place. And mm. I was like, okay, okay. Then I didn't know what to do, but Nikki came up with a good idea. So we're going with it. <laughs> Good job, Nikki. Um, so what we're going to do is my mom sent us some business tips in advance. Nikki and I are going to play those, and then we're going to react to them. And then, um, uh, like, we'll react to them in real time, and we'll just tell my mom whether she's right or wrong. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding, Mom. Uh, and then finally, after we get through that, what I'd like to do is highlight a few women-owned businesses right here in Atlanta. Okay. So, as always, Nikki, you are the voice of the audience. Okay. Um, the voice of God. Oh, wait. Hold on. Anyway. <laughs> Call me the voice of reason. <laughs> oh, I that's it. That. I got confused. <laughs> uh, so, but anyway, so pop in any time and be like, Selena, you're not making any sense. Right in the middle of a sentence. Just like that. Be the best place. Yep. Okay. Got it. So, let's start with that pulse check I was talking about. According to the U.S. Census Bureau, about one in five employer businesses were owned by women. That's 1.2 million or 20.9% in 
in 2019. So we keep getting a lot of 2019 stats. <laughs> I think the pandemic messed up a lot of uh, yeah. different. So like even when I went and tried to get newer data, it was really so focused on the pandemic that right. it didn't seem that helpful. So I just want to be clear. These statistics are a little bit older, but um, these businesses have also previously reported about 1.8 trillion in annual revenue and they employ in the in the neighborhood of 11 million workers and i say that because i couldn't find those same stats for 2019 those are actually 2018 stats i'm sorry guys i'm doing my best <laughs> if you don't if you can't tell it bothers me but i can't find the latest data um but compared to men women-led startups tend to be in healthcare in social assistance or accommodation and food service and the decision making behind the scenes is different so with women it's more focused on things like flexible hours mm. and then also about balancing work and family ob obligations these are things that they report as important so it doesn't seem very shocking okay mm. for the reason that we know that women are both domestic goddesses still and bringing home the paychecks <laughs> so patriarchy they're doing all the things um, any guess on which state has the highest proportion of female owned businesses? This is as of 2018. Florida. Uh, oh, well, you know, okay. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> I have no Do idea. you want me to just tell you? Massachusetts. Okay. Okay. Vermont. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Oregon. No. Washington. Mm -hmm. California. Are we just seeing how Arkansas. many states you know now? Or? <laughs> and I'm done. Hawaii. So, I, I don't know. I don't have anything more than I was that. close. Georgia had the eighth most female business owners in the country. So, I thought that was interesting. Go us! <laughs> As of 2018. So, uh, when there's certainly, uh, excuse me, while there's certainly been progress, there are significant barriers for women. I think that's important, an important thing to mention. But uh, I read that limited funding, gender biases, and limited government support factor in, and we'll link to a Forbes article that breaks all of this down. I love that I read it. I've never experienced it. I've only read it. <laughs> so now let's move on to a little section that I'm going to call, Let's Ask Sabrina. So. <laughs> Now that we have some framing for what's happening with women-owned businesses, let's also hear from someone who's owned one or two. But before we hear from my mom and hear her advice specifically, I'd like to tell you a little bit about her because otherwise she might be a complete stranger to you. And then also, like, what gives her the right <laughs> to have these opinions? So first and foremost, I would describe my mother as an artist and a creator. She is truly one of a kind. I've met a lot of talented people in my life, and yet still she is probably the most talented person I've ever met. She can sing, she can dance, and she can act. She's funny. Like, really funny? Like, not just kind of funny? Uh, but she's also whip smart, and we may <laughs> not always see eye to eye, <laughs> but she has made me who I am, and definitely when it comes to both my work ethic and my drive. So her career experience, I would describe, is as wide and varied as her talents. <laughs> so she's been in marketing and event planning. She's done general contracting work, sold real estate and insurance. She's been a mail carrier, a pharmaceutical tech, and she's held customer service jobs of every stripe. For the last 15 years or so, she's been a licensed neuromuscular therapist. I would describe her as a healer. Uh, she knows a lot about the human body, and when it messes up, she actually knows how to fix it. It's been helpful for me, I will say that much. More recently, she's been working to launch her own line of healthy snacks. So, the woman has always done things on her own terms. She's made her own rules. Like, imagining my mom at a desk is like me trying to imagine like a ferret like, or any animal, like, just suddenly, like, in people's clothing for no reason. It just, like, doesn't necessarily make any sense. <laughs> yeah, it just, it's just not going to happen. I think she finds um, that kind of environment stifling and the office politics a little mind-numbing. So, I don't know where that's coming from. How strange. Um, so, instead, she's often been her own boss in finding ways to harness more creative pursuits. With that in mind, shall we get down to it? Let's do it. Okay. Number one. Oh, wait. Can I add, though? You're going to do 
a really long list, which is too long for the main feed, right? Yes. So you're going to give a little extra for the Patreons this week. I am. So okay. we'll cover a couple. Well, we're going to cover about four, and that's going to be for everyone. And then if you're a Patreon, <laughs> you get all the best ones. <laughs> They're all good. I don't know. All right. Number one. Be a business owner because it is something that inspires you. It truly takes a certain mindset to be an entrepreneur. I bet. <laughs> I bet. I think it takes a certain mindset and also a certain confidence that you can do it. Yes, I think that's you absolutely You can't doubt right. yourself. There's no room for that. Yeah. And that's why I work for someone else. Mm-hmm. Because that's too much stress for me. It so, is. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's, I'm sure if I found something that I was passionate about, I'm sure I could do it. I'm not sure I want all the administrative, the overhead, the this, that, and the other sort of The minute stress. I think about coordinating my own insurance, I'm out. Oh, yeah. <laughs> coordinating and paying for it. Yeah. You have to pay for that stuff. Yeah. Oof, that's right. No, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. So good for her. And good for all the other people who, who, who want to do it. Like, I really, I have such a high level of admiration for people who strike out on their own like that. Um, so. It's really impressive. I think that it it is a very specific personality. So it's two things, right? It's a specific personality to try it. It's also a very specific personality to succeed. And that's the part that scares me is I get analysis paralysis. And so if the whole world is open to me and I can do whatever I want, I might never move forward because I'm not going to know where to even start. Yeah. And I'm going to be like, this is really hard. And now I don't know where to go. Well, and I think it takes a certain level of luck. Oh, for sure. Right place, right time a lot of times. Mm -hmm. You hear that a lot with people who are really big business owners. They just happen to be the one business in town that didn't go under, and then they use that to their advantage or whatever. Yeah. So, number one, it's a goodie. Good tip. Yep. Number two. What most people consider a failed attempt, I know for me, is what I call a recalibration. This allows for honing in and acceptance for a change in plans when an inspiration leads me in a more desired direction. On Peloton, some of the instructors refer to that as failing forward. Ooh, I so, like that. Yeah, capitalizing on, uh, you can use the word mistakes or just like on the things that didn't work. And you yeah. can use those to, like, like your mom said, recalibrate to see what wasn't working and figure out how to fix it. Yeah, and you know, that's uh, it's great to think about that for business, but I don't think that's just for business. I think that's really, you can apply that to so many facets of life mm -hmm. um, because I think, if we're if we're not at least somewhat learning from our mistakes or um, if we're not recalibrating or failing forward or whatever it is, then, well, dang, we're just doing the same thing over and over again. And that sounds like Groundhog Day, which sounds terrible. Yeah. And I, I, I agree with you. I think that's something I sort of try to keep in mind because for a lot of us, failure has been the enemy. Like failure is the thing you're trying to avoid. Like there's a certain way you're supposed to live your life because that's the way that works. It's the, the path of least resistance. And so you do that because it makes other things easier, but then you've very, you, you've really limited yourself. You've really focused yourself on this one way of doing things at the at the risk of missing all the other potential ways you could do it. And so it might not work. Like you try something as lame as trying a new route home from work. You try it. It didn't work. But what you learned is there's an ice cream shop there on the corner that you'd love to try on the weekend. You know, like you sort mm -hmm. of have to experience new things and try them in order to find other things. So I agree with you. Yeah. I think, well, don't agree. Not mine. I agree with you, Miss Serena. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Um, I think I, so I definitely agree with it and I see the merit in it. I think seeing the merit in something and practicing it in your own life can be do two different things for the very reason that like, uh, trying to overcome, uh, one's perfectionistic tendencies, let's mm -hmm. say. And for kind of what you were, uh, talking about there is this idea that like, Failure is this thing that we were sort of taught to avoid. Mm -hmm. So like trying to retrain your brain to embrace that is mm -hmm. something that can be helpful. I think is something that you really have to put your mind on. It's a real exercise. Yeah. I don't think it's just going to happen naturally. So, not for some people, maybe for others. Yeah. Good for, for them. Some people. Good for them. Yeah. How about it? Number three. 
Have faith in your product, your services, and your company. This is about you and your path for the wonderful life that you are choosing to live. Mom really had her guru hat on, I feel like. Oh, you know, I do think this sort of, in a way, ties to the first one, um, which was like to to find something you feel really passionate about and kind of throw your weight behind it. Mm -hmm. I think you cannot... I mean, I imagine you cannot succeed if it's not something you believe in. Even this podcast, like we couldn't show up week after week, day after day, if it wasn't something we felt we really believed in. Yeah, I think I think I have to do that. Um, that's a conscious exercise that I make, um, whether f- really for anything I have going on. If I can't find like that good nugget in there that makes sense for like why I'm going to this thing or spending time with X people or going to X workplace or whatever the case is. If I can't find the good in that and the, and like the reason why, why I'm showing up every day. Oh, that's not good. Yeah. That's not good. That's dispassionate. And yeah, I really don't, I don't know how, how long that can last. Yeah. Thanks mom. Uh, number four and final one for our, uh, for our regular listeners, <laughs> for the main feed, for, <laughs> for you normies, I'm, just kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. When you create from a place of joy, every aspect of its growth will be satisfying. Truly obtaining your goal is greater when you enjoy the journey along the way. They all uh, feed together. Yeah, for sure. And that last part, enjoying the journey, is that we're talking about like a mental, a mental struggle. Um, my life is a series of checklists, and I forget that I'm having fun along the way. Yeah. We opened this episode talking about our trip to Disney, and it was like this series of reservations and rides we needed to get to. And at a point, I finally looked at Kyle, and I was like, we are supposed to be enjoying this. I don't want to do these checkboxes the whole way. And so I think that uh, beyond business. And I know we're talking about business, but beyond business, the idea of enjoying the ride is challenging. But I think that it's easier when it's something you really feel passionate about and you really enjoy. Yeah. But we've talked about this with the podcast too. It's also relevant here, how it becomes this series of tasks to accomplish. Like sitting here thinking about editing this episode later is like, okay, that'll be a a fun thing to do. Just joy. And it's hard to remember to enjoy the journey to get there. Yeah. Yeah. It's good. It's just good. It's just good. good. And it, I think this is, I, I think like taking a moment to stop and go through these is really important because I think, um, I think we just need these reminders. Mm-hmm. Um, because I think like these, it's not like my mom is like giving this advice that you would get, um, that's like super specific. To mm. like, well, first you get your business plan right. together. Because like, I think if I would sum up all of this, first you got to get your mind right. Right. And that's the kind of advice that she's giving here. And I think that is important for like, um, uh, almost like affirmation type stuff. Mm-hmm. So are we ready? Are you, you're having a thought? Yes. The other thing that I'm hearing there, and I don't want to put words into your mom's mouth. Um, but the other thing I'm hearing there is, um, achieving your goals. And I think sometimes you hit milestones and I'm purely speaking from the experience of like professional milestones in my own life or like podcast related milestones. You forget to stop for a second and catch your breath and look around. Like if you envision it like climbing a mountain and you've got this goal and you finally get to the top, sometimes you forget to just sit down on a rock and look around and say like, where did I come from? What did I have to overcome to get here? How much have I grown to do this? And then look forward to the next thing. Reflection. We forget that part. So I do. I, I And I feel like I see it as a common theme. Like we just don't stop for a second and say like, holy crap, we just did this amazing thing. And I think it's this like culture of like drive and movement and keep going and keep going and better and faster and more and more. And you forget to stop and say like, oh my gosh, Selena, we hit 2,500 listens or, um, you know, we, we hit a hundred Instagram followers. We forget to do that sometimes. Mm -hmm. That stinks. Yeah. It robs you of your joy. Well, we just, we can't be robbed. The last thing that I want to cover today were some Atlanta specific businesses Mm -hmm. that are woman owned. So let's do that with uh, Unexpected Atlanta starting off the grouping. 
This was founded by Akila McConnell in 2015. They offer the number one Atlanta walking tour, and their team is filled with Atlanta natives who are also storytellers and food lovers. So there's a food tour, but there's also an MLK Jr. tour. So they're incorporating the city's important civil rights history as well, which I just think is really interesting. Like, I'm really interested interested in looking into this one. I had not heard of it. I found it in a, in a larger list of Atlanta businesses. And, um, like, I want to go check that out. So I don't usually think about doing tours in our own backyard, mm -hmm. but I don't know. I thought it could be interesting. Another one is for keeps books. This is a bookstore that opened in 2018 by Rosa Duffy. And this is in sweet Auburn, which is a historically black neighborhood in Atlanta. According to a GQ article I ran across, she couldn't always get her hands on the books she wanted the most for keeps was born from that failure of the market. It's a space designed to put readers in conversation with black writers and with ideas they'd never find in the narrow African-American sections of other stores. Oh, cool. So there are books for purchase, but what I also found really interesting is that she showcases rare books that are part of her own personal collection. Oh. So it does seem very much that they really want to start a conversation here. Mm -hmm. um, so it is more about than like just selling books, which I think is nice and immersive. Mm -hmm. And then there's the Village Retail. I've also heard it called the Village Market. But it was started by uh, Lakeisha Hellman in 2016. From what I've read at the time, she started bringing together uh, local black businesses and black brands under the banner of the Village Market. And then um, during the pandemic, she opened a brick and mortar location in Pont City Market. So I've been there. I just didn't know that this was the background of the store. Mm -hmm. um, it's a real. It's really cute, and they're um, there in Pont City Market, but they're also online, and you can find apparel, home goods, and items such as clothes, furniture, art, and wellness and beauty products. I think it's important to say that this isn't just about like selling stuff. Uh, her mission is greater than that. I read in an AJC article featured on their website that the goal is also to empower black entrepreneurs through education, community engagement, and efforts to grow existing black businesses by exposing them to other black businesses. And then I feel like finally we would be remiss to not mention Rushing Trading Company here in our own neck of, neck of the woods. Um, this is the, we've talked about them a few times now, but uh, it's, it's cool. It's ran by a mom-daughter duo. How can I not mention this in a podcast where we're literally listening to tips from my own mother? Um, so uh, I also believe that Cloudland Coffee that they use exclusively is owned by a woman i want to say in john's creek so we'll link to these various businesses and some longer lists lists for you to explore and i will go explore my lisp <clears throat> i think we probably have a, a more conscious consumer base than ever before that was kind of one of the things i was thinking about when i was pulling together this list when i was uh looking at doing this extra sugar you know, people want to know who made their product. They want to know who's selling it to them. They want to know what's going, where that money's going to on the back end. And I think that's because we're learning in real time why that matters, uh, maybe more so than ever. I think that we just used, there used to be a veil. You know, we didn't really know. We were just like buying stuff. So women leading uh, one in five of those employer businesses is, that's nice. I think that's a great start, but I also think it could be better. And one way we can contribute to those numbers is by contributing to these businesses. So let's do what society has told us we're so good at for so long. Let's go shopping, but let's also build, let's support, and let's achieve because I think we're pretty good at that too. And that's this week's Extra Sugar.